and next we have a series of speed talks lined up for you all on mainstreaming gender and youth in the energy transition so can i please welcome on stage eduarda zogpi climate youth influencer brazil mr abhishek gupta chief operating officer generation unlimited unicef uh, we have ms vishali mishra director communications and advocacy asia global energy alliance for people and the planet and i'll request abhishek to kick start this Good afternoon. I am Abhishek. Uh, as you can see, uh, I am a male on the wrong side of 40s, which makes me patently misfit for talking about either gender or youth, uh, which is our topic: mainstreaming youth as and gender and energy transition. That said, I'm I'm replacing uh, my colleague Dwarka, so pardon me for that and. what i'll do is i'll try and close in 2 minutes so you don't have to endure me too much uh there are just two areas of work that i want to talk about when we talk about mainstreaming youth particularly in the energy transition i want to talk about uh, an area of work that unicef and uva works on which is mainstream which is green skills and green jobs and the second thing i want to talk about is the participation of young people uh as we transition to energy so first on the green skills and green jobs there are two ways of cutting it first is that you can think about new green skills or green jobs as silos wherein you are looking for things like solar technicians or let's say uh, ev mechanics which are which are roles in themselves uh, the that's great and, and and we will have many more roles and many more green skills coming in but one thing that i want to caution from the side of young people is that typically the jobs are a lagging indicator in some way it you know young people need jobs today right uh if i train a young person to be let's say um uh, as i was talking to you about the ev mechanic and if there are not sufficient uh evs to uh to repair uh you you are playing with the livelihood of a young person uh so there have to be sufficient amount of work available for young people and therefore the probably a a better way of looking at looking at the green skilling and green jobs is to thinking of looking at every skill and every job and making it slightly more greener uh, which can be done for example if you are training young people to become plumbers and electricians now you can bring in a ev module into it so that every young person also is able to do a little bit of plumbing on the on the solar tech as a solar technician uh, can also do electrical work and if they don't find sufficient uh, solar systems to um, to repair then they can still earn a livelihood so that's the first point i wanted to make and the second point that i wanted to make and i think gef is doing is go is going to be i'm sure is going to be doing a good job of it is to give young people a seat on the table um uh, it, it's not enough to it's it's not enough to say that we are going to leave, hopefully leave a better world and a climate for young people but also ask them to participate so that you know they, when they inherit this world from us uh they also feel the ownership of it a, a good example of uh, getting them a seat on the table is uh a work some of the work that we at unicef are doing with ministry of environment where we have built a built an app called meri life uh within the mission life uh mission life that is being run by prime minister's office and we are we are creating opportunities for young people to to take multiple climate related actions for example how can they volunteer can they create opportunities for themselves and the communities to take small actions uh to be more green for you, you could be using more solar you could be using more public transport you could be switching off appliances more using biogas in rural areas so on and so forth and and then take pictures of what they are doing and sort of uploading it creating social rewards recognition systems for that so that young people are not only more aware but are participating in this transition so those are two things that i would have i would like to say uh how we can main you know use to mainstream young people in the energy transition and and do that at scale thank you very much
Thank you, GF and ORIF, for the invitation to be here today and for acknowledging and promoting the role of women and young people in the energy transition. I was only 12 years old when I understood what climate change was. It all started with a teacher, and she noticed that I was getting more and more concerned about environmental issues and recommended I watch a documentary, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. This changed everything in my life. After learning our world was ending and no one was doing anything about it, I was furious. How come schools, the media, and politicians were not talking about the upcoming end of the world? Well, it took almost 20 years for us to realize climate change is real and is not going anywhere. Women and children are at the forefront of the climate crisis, as is RMI. With increased water scarcity, crop failure, and higher vulnerability to extreme weather events, they bear the brunt of the environmental challenges we face. 80% of those displaced by climate are women, who are also responsible in many parts of the world for collecting water and fuel for cooking in order to sustain their households. Yet, a staggering 3.4 billion people lack access to reliable um, electricity. This restricts income generating activities, education, personal well-being, as well as health and food supply. Despite the clear need to have women at the center of our efforts, we're still underrepresented in climate negotiations. Women were less than 34% of country negotiating teams at COP27 in Egypt. This number has been steady since 2017. And in the energy sector, these numbers are even lower. The International Renewable Energy Agency published a report revealing that 32% of the renewable energy workforce are women and 22% and are in the oil and gas industry. We need more women in the renewable energy sector and RMI is working hard to ensure this happens. We need more women in STEM and we need more women in decision-making positions. With these daunting numbers, sometimes we find ourselves discouraged from moving forward. It's very, very hard. But I'm hopeful. And what gives me hope is youth. We are the first generation who will truly suffer the impacts of climate change. And sometimes we're noisy because we're desperate. This desperation is the fuel that drives us to make changes on our planet. The most inspiring solutions I have seen come from young minds who are given the opportunity, the funding, and the skills needed to flourish in their sectors. Throughout this event, I heard a lot about the importance of capacity building, and young people need it the most because we represent the future of the energy workforce and also our future leaders. There are almost two billion young people in the world today, and 90% are living in developing countries. Africa has the youngest uh, population in the world, with 70% of sub-Saharan Africa being under 30. There are more than 200 million youth in India and 200 million in China alone. If we want to solve the climate crisis, we need to give more opportunities to youth. In prioritizing women and youth, we demonstrate our commitment to the UN 2030 agenda that urges our countries not to leave anyone behind. And not leaving anyone behind also means ensuring energy access, because energy is a human right and vital to alleviating poverty. It should be democratized, decentralized, and made affordable to all. We not only need to triple our renewable energy capacity by 2030, but we also need to build the infrastructure needed to bridge the energy access gap. We need to scale the deployment of battery energy storage systems, distributed renewable energy technologies, and build capacity for utilities, regulators, and governments. Most importantly, we need to ensure a just energy transition, one that recognizes that climate change impacts us all, but has different and more severe effects in marginalized communities. To end on a positive note, I try to bring RMI's concept of applied hope to my daily routine. We can choose to outline all the mistakes we have done in the past to damage our planet, or we can choose to focus on the present and how our decisions today will affect our future. And by future, I mean the next generation. 
Your children and your grandchildren will live in the world you choose to build today. We cannot wait another 20 years to change. We need to change now. Thank you. When the world was out there discussing climate change and energy transition at the world stage, a group of lovely women and dynamic women came together in Vietnam to set up a network that was all heart, but led by some of the sharpest minds in the country. The Climate Leaders Network, launched by GIAP and its partners, IFC, USAID, and DEFART, is aimed at increasing women's leadership, visibility, and influence, contributing to climate action. I've had the immense privilege of being part of the network, spearheaded by my wonderful colleague, Sunita Dube, country lead, Vietnam for GIAP. Over to you, Sunita. Um, thank you, Vaishali. Um, can we have the slide up? So I think what uh, I'm going to do today is, and our effort in Vietnam is, we talk a lot about um, gender and mainstreaming of gender. We should see climate through the gender lens. And what we are trying to do in a very small way is what, how to put that into action and, and what that would look like when we start moving from to a, a climate-friendly world or where we are going to start looking at the energy transition from the gender lens and what role women are going to play in that. So I am going to share, um, can we have a slide before this? Um, Thank you. This is not a GAP study. This is a study done by uh, IFC, and this is based on almost 250 corporations that they interviewed. Like, where do you see, when, it, when you look at the leadership, you see that women are really not represented, even at COP27. And I'm not sure whether COP28 is going to be very different. But when it comes to labor force, at least in Vietnam, you see that you know the women kind of have the equal burden in Vietnam, and they are very active labor force, and but we don't have the voices. And how do you kind of like really bring female or women's voices in some of the con con countries where we are talking about energy transition? For example, Vietnam is also a, a jet peak country, which is part of the G7 and G7 um, initiative. And, and we are getting $15.5 billion to kind of move towards energy transition. In that, what is the role of women? Because you don't want to have a transition where women are left behind because they are part of this labor force. Um, can we go to the second slide, third slide, please? Next one. And I think this is something that I think it's really, number speaks for its, uh, uh, themselves. You can see that you know what happens when you bring uh, women in the leadership positions, what happens to those companies when they are the decision makers? And you can, you can see the numbers, like you know, how they take climate-friendly uh, initiatives. They are, they're more kind of uh, the climate mitigation and the GHG emission in those companies kind of go down. So it's just not, uh, I would say that, you know, that uh, we need to tick a box in gender inclusion. It, it really makes economic sense. It makes climate sense to kind of give these leadership positions to women or to bring more women in this kind of leadership and, and give them voices in the energy transition and make sure they are not left behind, not just at the middle level, but also at the decision-making level. To make this into an action-oriented piece in Vietnam, what we have started, what my colleague Vaishali was mentioning is a network of women, which is supported by IFC and uh, Australian government. And this is a network where we have the C-suite leadership uh, of companies which are battery storage company, uh, electric car companies, green hydrogen companies. And uh, uh, can we have another picture? And we are going to show you some photo that we, this is, we have had two convenings of these, uh, all the C-suite women in Vietnam. And the discussion there is like, you know, um, they are action oriented they are ready to make changes and this is our uh, this is a recent picture that we had where we um, there these are ceos these are deputy ceos of vietnamese companies and coming together uh, combining our voices together uh, 
and also making sure that those voices are heard in the halls of power where decisions are being made. And they are going not just with like, you know, this is our right, but also going with strategies, with action, and saying that our companies are going to move towards greener path. We are going to make, uh, we are going to say that we are not going to build any more gasoline car. We are only going to build only electric cars. There's a company where the C that company has made that choice in Vietnam, despite kind of like really giving up on profit. So this is um, what we are doing in Vietnam. Uh, we are uh, going to institutionalize to formalize this network, and we hope that this is something that is inspiring and many other countries can as well do this and kind of like really uh, create that community of um, action-oriented uh, female leadership in each of these countries, and their vision is very different. Their, I would say their kind of like really participation and bringing them on is going to be very strategic as we move towards more uh, climate-friendly world, potentially, and come up with uh, some climate mitigation. Yeah, and I think uh, this, uh, you can see, as reminded by my colleague, that we we choose a color, and uh, so the first color was green, and the second time we all wore pink. The idea is like how we feel connected, and you you are say that we are in this fight together. And I think for us, like this kind of a color theme, and it also repre represents our logo, which is green and pink, and that was Barbie pink. So this is what we came up with. Thank you so much. Thank you.